This is Torah portion. I'll try and say it correctly. <clears throat> Pinchas. Now, um, I never pronounce his name like that. He's, I always call him Pinchas. So I'll probably call him that all the way through the teaching. But apologies to anybody who's particular about pronunciations. So, <clears throat> so we'll start with um, looking at the end of last week's Parsha. And then um, <clears throat> we will go on to um, look at this idea of these people who nearly made it, but didn't quite. We'll look at the idea of being vigilant and taking heed. And then we'll have an example in part two of somebody who perhaps should have been a bit more vigilant. And we will also um, end the part by looking at the idea of the Restoration of Yehovah's kingdom. So, last week's Parsha ended with, Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of Yehovah was kindled against Israel. So they were seduced into idolatry. And Yehovah said unto Moshe, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before Yehovah against the sun, that the fierce anger of Yehovah may be turned away from Israel. Moshe said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one of his men that were joined unto Baal pure. <clears throat> and behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moshe and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Pincus, the son of Eliatza, the son of Aharon, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 24,000. So <clears throat> this all takes place in Shittim, which was the last camping ground of Israel before they crossed the Jordan to begin the conquest of the promised land. The exact location is unknown, but they're right on the edge. After 40 years in the wilderness, the people were so close to taking hold of the promises of Yehovah and entering into the land flowing with milk and honey. So this generation <clears throat> has watched the first generation die off. They are probably aware that the time is at hand. There may have even been a jubilant sense of expectation they will no doubt have held on to the words Yehovah spoke to Moshe when he passed judgment after the sin of the spies. In Numbers 14, we read that a time was put on how long they would be in the wilderness. In Numbers 14, it says, Truly as I live and as it, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of Yehovah, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt, this is the first generation and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers, and none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he is a different spirit and has followed me fully, and I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Therefore he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness and would make their offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the lands. Say to them as I live, declares Jehovah, what you have said in my hearing I will do to you. They said, oh, that we might die in the wilderness. He says, your dead body shall fall in this wilderness and all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me. Not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh and Joshua, the son of Nun. What set them apart? Numbers 32, <clears throat> they have wholly followed Yehovah. They followed Yehovah always, no matter what. But your little ones, he said, will become a prey. I will bring in and they shall know the land that you've rejected. So the people of the second generation are aware of all this. Oh, we're going to go in and we're going to get the land. But as for you, your dead body shall fall in this wilderness and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years, shall suffer for your faithfulness, faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. 40 years. Now they would have been able to mark this off and they would have had this sense of this is it all them people they've died it was said that we were the people who would go in the 40 years is up 
The finality of the judgment absolute in the next verse. I, Yehovah, have spoken. Surely this will I do to all this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to a full end and they, they shall die. And these people will have witnessed all this. They would have had this, wow, we're going to go in. The promises, this land is going to be ours. Remember, these people have already had victories. And um, <clears throat> they were so close, they could probably see the promised land. So there we have it. The first generation will die off. There'll be 40 years in the wilderness. The second generation will successfully enter the promised land. So I wonder how those of the second generation were feeling just before the events of Numbers 25, where they camped at Shittim. They were right on the border of the promised land. As I say, they'd already experienced great military victories. They're practically there, and yet along come the Midianite women. Something new, something exciting. Oh, what's this? What a blessing from Yehovah, some might even have said. But these women offered the Israelite men sexual favors if only they would worship their God with them. How did this disaster unfold? Moshe speaks later in the book of Numbers in chapter 31. Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to trespass against Yehovah in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of Yehovah. So through the council of Balaam. What was Balaam's advice to the women that turned the Israelites away from Yehovah? We see uh, that what went on detailed in Revelation 2. I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So it was the advice of Balaam to send the women of Moab out to the Israelites to offer the men sexual favors if only they would worship their God with them. Balaam was a prophet and no doubt knew both uh, Yehovah's standards of morality as well as his jealousy against worship and any other gods. So pretty rotten stuff. 24,000 Israelites died. But Yehovah's anger also arose <clears throat> both against the Moabites, Midianites, and against Balaam because of this. Numbers 25, 16, we read then, Yehovah spoke to Moshe saying, harass the Midianites and attack them. For they harassed you at their schemes by which they seduced you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a leader of Midian, their sister who was killed in the day of the plague because of Peor. In Joshua 13, we read, Balaam also the son of Peor was uh, the one who practiced divination, was killed with the sword by the people of Israel among the rest of their slain. And later in Numbers 31, they warred against Midian as Yehovah commanded Moshe and killed every male. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain, Evi, Rechem, Zer, Her, Reba, uh, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword. You can't help but think that Yehovah is letting us know his heart towards those that would lead his people away from his commandments. Those who by appealing to the flesh would lead Yehovah's people to go after other gods. Now in the New Testament, Peter um, talks of false teachers who lead people astray and describes them as going the way of Balaam. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Presumptuous they are, self-willed, they are not afraid to blaspheme the glorious ones. But as angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these as natural b brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things they do not understand and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have trained, hearts trained in greed, accursed children. So they entice unsteady souls. Just exactly what we see in our Parsha. Steady souls being enticed. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. But was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. What was Balaam's transgression? Going with the princes of Moab. He'd been told, 
JP looked at this last week, not to go, but that wasn't the answer he wanted. And we see in Numbers 22, um, he's restraining the angel of Jehovah, says to him, your way is perverse before me. And the word for perverse is your rat. We see here, to rush headlong. And to rush headlong is a great description of those who would seek to satisfy their own agendas by tailoring Jehovah's word to suit their desires. The way of Balaam, consider the counsel of Balaam, pandering to the lust of the flesh to lead many astray, many who are happy to go after other gods. This describes exactly what the ear tickling teaches that so many enjoy listening to and doing. That's it really, isn't it? Completely and utterly, that is what they are all about. All these um, preachers and stuff that really achieve great popularity. And they have their messages. And what they're actually doing is just pandering to the lust of the flesh. It was interesting this week when I was looking through and studying stuff. And I came across some articles, Christian articles. And um, this whole idea of um, the Lord gives you an eternal covenant. And you can't do anything to, you know, distance yourself from him. You, you have his... Um, assurance forever no matter what you do you can sin you can do whatever um just stuff that i can imagine appealing to people um who basically want to go after the lusts of their flesh and what they're doing is they're offering them another god it's not the god of scripture this is another god and they fall for this god and it's essentially um exactly what we see um the people doing um, in last week's Parsha and this week's. Speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. The prophet's madness was that he rushed or pushed headlong, just like the teachers that Peter describes who revel in the deceptions. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Wells without water, as we saw a couple of weeks ago. This is a description of what it is to be wicked and evil. For speaking, because they don't fulfill their purpose, wells are supposed to have water. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. Again, appealing to people's lusts of the flesh, what they actually want to do. And of course, the flesh does not want to submit to Jehovah's word. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption, Whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. In John 8, we read, Yeshua said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. The truth, the word, sets you free. But so many take it and twist it into a lie and become themselves slaves of corruption. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have an itch in ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Um, well, there's been a few people, hasn't there, lately, um, who have come from the secular world, who have decided to become Christians. Um, and they, they all seem to adopt... Um, a very mainstream idea of what Christianity is or Catholicism, stuff like that. Um, I just think it's really sad because it's, it's, it's this, isn't it? People want people to tell them what will suit, as it says, uh, their own passions. People have a sense, don't they, that um, there is truth in the Word and there's truth in Scripture and that there is a God of creation and there's more to life than just the material world. And so they go looking for truths and stuff and <clears throat> ultimately what they want is a truth that is comfortable for them. Which is why people are happy to have these teachers around them who pander to the lust of the flesh. You don't challenge them. You'll tell them about a God who doesn't care what you do. He's not interested in that. You'll tell them complete nonsense and what they do they turn away from listening to the truth the word they go off into nonsense beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves 
They look great, they sound great, they might even sound really spiritual and Christian and stuff, but actually, they'll destroy you, they'll kill you. When Balaam spoke over the people of Israel, the first blessing he spoke in the name of Jehovah was that we are a people who dwell apart and will not be reckoned among the nations. Numbers 23, behold, a people dwelling alone and not counting itself among the nations, who can count the dust of Yaakov and number the fourth part of Israel. So that's who Jehovah's people are. They're separate. They dwell apart. So the first cause of attack against us are separateness from other nations and peoples. And so, by the way of the doctrine of Balaam, their enemies sought to destroy Israel by enticing them away from following Jehovah with all their hearts. Paul calls us to remember that we are to be set apart to Jehovah. We are his people. He is our God. He says, what agreement is the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst, be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Sons and daughters, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God and so we are. Everyone who thus hopes it and purifies himself as he is pure. Doesn't just crack on living and, oh, isn't it great? I can do whatever I want and stuff. No. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. We see many people in Numbers 25 who, despite the promises of Jehovah, chose to defile themselves physically and spiritually. They failed to bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. And they were really, really close to going in and being part of the people who inherited the promises. Now, it doesn't matter who you used to be before you turn to Jehovah and repentance. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you shall be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So it doesn't matter what background you've come from. You're not to be identified or, or your identity isn't wrapped up in what you used to be or how you used to behave. No, forget your former passions, you are now to be holy. That is set apart unto Jehovah. He says, I am the Lord your God. I am holy, so you must be holy. <clears throat> to be holy to me, I am Jehovah and holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So being holy involves being separate that we should belong to Jehovah. This is the one thing that these people who fell forgot all about. The lust of the flesh allowed themselves to be dragged away and lose this separateness. Sanctify them, separate them out, make them holy, set apart in the truth. Your word is truth. So separate it in accordance with the word. The Lord is holy, the commandment is holy and righteous and good. We're told in Deuteronomy 7, 6, you are a people holy to Jehovah your God. Jehovah your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You're separated out, you're separate. Same in the New Testament, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people separated out, <clears throat> people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we're told, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. As I say, <clears throat> what matter what you used to be, who you used to be, the thing that um, you have to remember is that you are now Jehovah's. You walk according to his word. You're separate from the world. And it's quite remarkable that when you submit to him and surrender to him and walk in his ways, the way you view the world completely changes. And it's, um, it's not something that is appealing to you anymore if you love Jehovah. All that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and pride of light is not from the Father, it's from the world. You start to see things the way Jehovah sees things. You see these things as transient and of not of any worth compared to walking after him. 
The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And the will of God is for us to walk in his ways and be separate, apart, set apart to him, holy. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So <clears throat> this is really strong language, isn't it? You adulterous people. Um, the Lord's laying it out. He's saying you can't want to be the friend of the world and um, not expect to be my enemy. And when I read these things, I do think of these people who um, recently become Christians and I just think, you know, hopefully, genuinely, they will come to understand who Yehovah is and will submit and surrender to him completely and follow him. They must know that if they do, that the world won't think they're so wonderful anymore. And indeed, if they truly surrender to him, then, well, the world will actually turn on them. And there's so many people <clears throat> who don't want the world to turn on them, who are happy to be popular, and that's what's important to them. But we read, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Yeshua said, you will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Interesting. The one who endures to the end. Today's tale is a tale of a bunch of people who didn't endure to the end. Very close. but didn't quite make it. Just as Jehovah brought the people out of Egypt, so he has brought us out of the world to be separate to him, to love him, not the transient things of the world. Many Israelites were seduced by the desires of the flesh and enticed into idolatry. They defile themselves. All those who would go after the flesh are easily enticed into idolatry. We see so much of it, don't we? <clears throat> people who want the flesh to be accommodated, pandered to, will find themselves a God. They'll find themselves a Messiah who hasn't got a problem with their lifestyle choices. So <clears throat> I looked at this it was three years ago. Um, and I looked at it again and I noticed something in it which I wanted to include, so I put it in. It's a warning against the harlot that we find in Proverbs 7. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So cherish the commandments. Let them be a part of all you do and all you think and feel. We see that cherishing the commandments is life. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend. To keep you from the strange woman, the harlot, from the adulteress, and the word there is nachri, with their smooth words. See this word here is from this other word, which means calamity, disaster, and misfortune. So the harlot leads you into calamity. The harlot has smooth words to draw us into sin. So we need the corresponding and greater power of Yehovah's words to keep us from our clutches. Remember, cherishing the commandments goes hand in hand with wisdom and understanding. And it equals life. And it keeps you from the harlot. The harlot is what one who appeals to the desires of the flesh. But it's also, in Scripture, a false church or religion. And going after the harlot is spiritual fornication. As we go through, we'll see um, the harlot actually more clearly representing a church or false religion. At the window of my house, I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense. We read, how can a young man keep his way pure, guarding it according to your word? Here we have a man lacking sense, not guarding his way. Passing along the street near a corner, taking the road to a house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. So the time of night and darkness is an interesting phrase because we are called to be children of the day, children of the light, all idioms for walking in the word. 
Ephesians 5, 8, we read, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So walk according to the word. So as we'll see later, there's also a call to put on the armor of God that you might be protected. 1 Thessalonians 5, you're all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do. Let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet, the hope of salvation. Be sober. Don't be given to wine. Wine represents false doctrine. Behold, a woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily, guarded of heart. She is loud and stubborn, or she is loud and rebellious. If feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. So she is not to find or arrange a meeting with. She's bold and has no shame. Proverbs 30, 20 says, this is the way of adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. She lies in wait like a predator, which puts me in mind of 1 Peter 5, 8. Again, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows. So she's religious, but she favors a God who is willing to receive her peace offerings while she lives as she pleases. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon, all three names for perfumes in this verse, are also found in um, Song of Solomon 4.14 as odiferous images of sexual love. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. So when I read he has gone on a long journey, I can't help but think of Yeshua's parables. Yeshua speaks to his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and they ask about the end of the age. And Yeshua answered and says, See that no one leads you astray. This is all the way through Scripture, isn't it? See that no one leads you astray. There's um, a whole world of people who are led astray. Um, people who would call themselves Christians, people who would call themselves Torah keepers, who are led astray and because they want the lust of their flesh pandered to, the flesh which won't submit to Yehovah's word. Maybe there's just something in it they don't like, and they allow themselves to be led astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. So, this is talking of false religion, harlotry. Because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Lawlessness will move away from walking in the word again. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Um, I was reminded this week of just um, in the past being around people who have very like um, self-congratulatory type of um, way of living. Like, we are the children of God. We are the Torah keepers. And they're all made up with themselves and stuff. And I just think, wow, I don't want to don't be like that. I see in Scripture these warnings of, Watch, take heed. I see these people so close to the end and they don't make it. I see Yeshua's warning. He says the one who endures to the end will be saved. Um, so don't be one of these people who's puffed up with their own sense of importance and just remain humble. And heed the warnings that are in Scripture. False Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So a warning here about being led astray. 
then an admonition to be vigilant. Therefore, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant who his master has set over his household to give them the food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant who his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, we will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he does not know. And he will cut him in pieces, put him at the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So be watchful, be sober-minded. We have drunkenness and the master's return and the coming of Yeshua in Luke 21. Watch yourselves. Lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation, which is the giddiness and headache caused by excessive drinking. Drinking representing false doctrine, of course. And drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. So this um, Baruno is um, to become heavy, dull, and unresponsive. You don't want your heart to become heavy, dull, and unresponsive. And we have the parable of the ten virgins, five of oil, they are ready, five have no oil for their lamps, Matthew 25. While they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. He answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And Yeshua is speaking with his disciples about the end of the age and his return, then we read the parable of the talents. He says, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. So the man in the parable is clearly a picture of Yeshua. We see a similar account in Mark 13. Concerning the day or hour, no one knows. Be on guard. Keep awake. You do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge. He keeps on, Yeshua, warning people like this. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants, going back to Matthew 25, came and settled accounts with them. The ones who do well here. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master, the servant who does badly. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has will more be given. And he will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the master on a long journey is Yeshua. His return is at the end of the age. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Indeed, Yeshua will return at the end of the age for his bride, Yeshua, the husband who has gone on a long journey. So when I read of a harlot who's religious, who says, my husband is on a long journey, I think of those who have entered into covenant, those who would call themselves the bride, yet they are not faithful. And I also think of a woman slash a church that is quick to lead many astray with seductive words, with promises of satisfying the desires of the flesh. Jude 4 says, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So taking the grace of God and saying, oh yeah, this is our chance or our excuse. We can just do whatever we want. Back to Proverbs 7. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. So this is this harlot that I've said before represents false religion and the false church. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast. So it doesn't go well, does it? Till an arrow pierces, an arrow pierces its liver as a bird rushes into a snare. He does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O oh sons, Listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. So, with much seductive speech, she persuades him with her smooth talk, flattery, 
telling him what he wants to hear, tickling the old ear, she compels him. So this word here, lecha, it's an interesting word that points further to the fact that what the harlot represents is a false church or religion. We see it in Deuteronomy 32. My doctrine or my teaching shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. And in Proverbs 4.2, for I give you good doctrine, forsake you not my law. So we see it here in Gisenius doctrine, knowledge, the car, properly summed and received, mentally instruction, also um, doctrine and learning, learning, <clears throat> teaching. So this harlot with persuasive doctrine and smooth talk, what does she do? She leads the unwise to their demise. Um, all the way in Proverbs 7, but we see the warning all the way through Scripture. So let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. However seductive the teaching is, um, don't go that way. The way is a way to death. Many a victim she has laid low. All her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Now, I think this is both a warning about being led astray by the desires of the flesh, losing sight of Jehovah's ways and being seduced by various lusts and a warning about falling for the smooth words, a false religion that can lead you into idolatry by appealing to those desires of the flesh. In the Baal Pure episode, we indeed have the harlot represented by the Midianite women who seduced those calling themselves Jehovah's people into idolatry. And we have the false prophet, Balaam, one who knew Jehovah, but had gone astray. Everything is cyclical. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. We have a false prophet and a whore at work together to destroy Jehovah's people. Now, there are two beasts mentioned in the book of Revelation. The first is ridden by a whore and apostate church. The second gives its power to the first and is also known as the false prophet. Revelation 13, behold, uh, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. So it's like a lamb, obviously making you think of Yeshua, but he spoke as a dragon, thinking of Hazatan. So we have the whore. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. It doesn't take uh, much, does it, for your mind to go straight to what I think is being described. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints with the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. And when I saw it, I wondered with great admiration. So mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Mother of harlots, mother of false churches that draw people away into spiritual fornication. Appealing to the desires of the flesh. And the flesh, as we mentioned before in Romans 8, 7, it says, The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So, yeah, the mother of harlots, the false churches that do what? Lead people away from following Yehovah. Lead them away to following false gods by doing what? Appealing to the desires of the flesh. See a false um, prophet and a whore mentioned, the whore that causes the world to be drunk. One of the seven angels of the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitutes, the great whore who was seated on many waters. We see here the waters that you saw with the prostitutes seated are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Yeah, all drunk on the absolute drivel. Mother of false churches that draws people away, appealing to the desires of their flesh, that panders to the distaste 
for obedience to Jehovah's word, filling them with the wine of her fornication, enticing them into spiritual adultery, i.e. idolatry, to go after another God, getting them drunk on false doctrine. And sometimes it might not be an established big church. Um, maybe it would be um, a fellow believer. Maybe it would be a fellow Torah keeper who um, <clears throat> panders to the desires of your flesh, your flesh which doesn't want to submit to God's law. Maybe there's something in his law that you're not keen on. I don't know what it might be. Whether it's circumcision, and it's, it's, it's tithing or something like that. And um, the desire of your flesh is to not submit to these things. So what would you, what would you have? You would have somebody who would come along and pander to these desires, getting you drunk on false doctrine, leading you astray. All through Scripture, we're warned. We're warned about the harlot. We're warned not to be led astray, but to stick to the word, to cherish the commandments, and that is our protection against the smooth words of those who would lead us astray. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, all just designed to leave you astray. Where does it lead? They didn't even know, but the end was death. 2 Peter 2.18, speaking loud, boasts of folly that, as we read before, they entice people by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. But please be in mind when it's talking about the passions of the flesh that it's not just talking about fornication and things like that, but it's also talking about the flesh in terms of not wanting to submit to Jehovah's word. Everything is cyclical. What has been is what will be. What has been done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. So we've seen the connection between the lust of the flesh and idolatry. Numbers 25, Israel abode in Shittim. The people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. People, and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Israel. They were seduced into idolatry. And I have impressed upon me the significance of the fact that the people in Numbers 25 were so close. These were the second generation. These were the people who were supposed to make it. Which is why it makes me think of these people. Um, we found the Torah. We are God's people. The self-congratulatory type people who become all full of themselves. I don't think that's a very safe place to be. We have the command to the judges of Israel. But all these people who think that they're just about to enter in the promises, slay you every one of his men that were joined unto Baal Pure. And what do we read? 24,000 perished by the plague. Now, as we'll see later, this is um, an incident that uh, lingers long in the memory of the people. We read it, and it's just a number that rolls off our tongue. But this is quite a huge thing to have occurred, isn't it? All these people, no doubt, would have been convinced in their hearts that they were shortly going to walk over the Jordan River and take hold of the promises of Jehovah. And they would have had all sorts of ideas why it was a good idea to do what they did. Oh, yeah, and this is, yeah, well, these are these people, and we want to be, make friends amongst the people. And we're just about to go into the land. We don't want to rock the boat. And this, so the Lord, he must have made this happen. This, this must be a good thing, and this is great. And it's just the flesh. And the only thing that will protect you from all that rubbish is close adherence to his word, cherishing his commandments. This generation has watched the first generation die off. The 40 years is up. Of course, it's us. We're going in. And yet, for some reason, they will also fall in the wilderness. Something new comes along, something that appeals to the flesh. And this is something that you see every now and again, isn't it? I don't know of anything for a little while, but people getting... I don't know, knocked off course by the latest little bit of doctrine that comes along, the latest idea. Ooh, oh, I like this. Um, again, something new and exciting comes along and people forget <clears throat> that what they need to do is cherish Jehovah's commandments. 
something that offers them a new spiritual experience even. That's what happened with the people in the Old Testament. And when I put up, um, everything is cyclical. It's not just like some catchphrase. It's because what's being shown us is to be educational for us because this is something that we will come across. This is something that will occur. Something exciting and different and gratifying. But it says in Proverbs 7, let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim she is laid low and all her slain are a mighty throng. In 1 Corinthians 10, we read, Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Don't be idolaters as some of their were. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We see that this is written with regards to the golden calf incident where we read in Exodus 32, They rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Don't be like them. And then, the warning continues. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some as them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. Now, as a quick aside, in Numbers, we read that 24,000 died. Was Paul wrong? One explanation, uh, explanation that came across was the apparent discrepancy will lead to a careful reading of both verses. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. 24,000 people died, and 23,000 of those 24,000 died in a single day. It's an example of the New Testament providing an application of events recorded in the Old Testament, not a revision. Back to Corinthians 1.10 and the warning. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. And what was their gripe? Oh, the manner, which represents the word, doesn't it? Now, these things happened to them as an example. They were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. We're to learn from these things. We're being warned. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. We are the people of God. We are going to go. You know, just take heed um, lest you fall. Let me read this. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. No test will be too difficult for you to bear, but every test will reveal what's in your heart. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Nothing will come along that you will be unable to resist. If you yield to temptation, it's because that's what you chose. People make all sorts of excuses. JP was talking the other week, wasn't he, about, oh, I'm struggling with this and I'm struggling with that. This is all about what you actually choose. What is most important to you? The Lord will not let you be tested beyond your ability. Go back to verse 12. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And stands there in the Greek, estami is yatsav in the Hebrew. And we looked at that in Parsha Balak. Moshe said to the people, Fear ye not, stand still, yatsav, and see the salvation of Jehovah, of the Lord. The Israelites were pursued, as we know by the Egyptians, a very real enemy, just as we have a very real enemy. We were told before, be sober-minded, be watchful, because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, just as we read about the harlot in Proverbs 7. So Hebrew yatsav, stand um, firm in the Greek histami. We find this word used in conjunction with wearing the armor of Jehovah. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. This is this histami. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand to Yatsav. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying 
at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. So fear not, stand still, yatsav, and see the salvation of the Lord. We're pursued by an adversary, Hasatan. We have to be mindful of the schemes of the devil, not to be led astray. How do we stand? How do we yatsav? Well, we looked at it, the armor of God. By walking in the truth, which is righteousness, by letting our walk be one that declares the good news of Yehovah, by demonstrating our faith and our obedience to the one in whom we trust, by being mindful of our deliverance and our wonderful Savior Yeshua, by wielding the word, and let's not forget, with prayer. Here in 1 Corinthians 10, we have the warning. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So maybe we think we're safe. We think we are carefully put on the armor of Yehovah that we stand. But just as Yeshua called for us to watch, here we are called to take heed. Standing firm and being watchful go hand in hand. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith. Act like men, be courageous, be strong. And this word here, stako, is from the Greek, histami, the Hebrew, yatsav. So we're called to stand firm. We're called to be courageous. This word in the Hebrew, chazak. Keep, cherish all the commandments which I command you this day, that you may be chazak. And that's the thing, isn't it, that people who want to walk in the flesh don't want to do. Because the flesh doesn't want to submit to Jehovah's commandments, to his law. But the people who truly love Jehovah are the people who love his commandments. They cherish them. They can't be led away from them because there's nothing that is appealing to them which is a deviation from his truth. Um, we're called to be courageous. It is a call to cherish his commandments. And we're called to be watchful. God never gets them. And he came to the disciples, found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray. The two go together. Romans 16. What are we to watch for? Examples here. Appeal to your brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions, create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. So anyone who would come with something different, like the whore of Proverbs 7, who wants to appeal to your flesh, will tell you things, flattery, things that you want to hear, just to lead you astray. Watch, brothers. For such persons do not serve our Lord uh, Messiah, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk, and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive, those who are not wise, who don't hold fast to the word. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose uh, what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. And then this, he who watches his way preserves his life. We're told to do this, to watch our way, to be careful. We're told to take heed. To watch is to watch and pray. We're not only told to watch and pray, we're told to be courageous, which means cherishing his, way, his word. Throughout scripture, we're called to be vigilant. Question, when are people least likely to be vigilant? Answer, when they think they have it all sewn up. You can think of all, of, you've probably all seen examples of me, of the fella in the race running along, already cheering like he's won, and somebody zooms past him. So when are you least likely to be vigilant? This call to be vigilant, when, oh, yeah, we've got it all sorted. Scripture tells us, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, I think Paul's message is, look at what happened to those calling themselves Jehovah's people. Look how easily they were led astray. The golden calf, what's that? Fashioning a God for themselves and attributing Jehovah's name to it serpents that came because what because they loathed the manner they loathed the word they became tired of it they wanted something different something new oh not this again 
And at Shatim, being led astray by the desires of the flesh into what? Fornication and idolatry. Look at them, then look at yourself and see if any of these things might be um, something that you have to um, take care of. So who was it that were able to stand and not fall in the Baal pure incident? Moshe addresses the people at Shittim in Deuteronomy 4. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you and do them, that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that Jehovah, the God of your fathers, has given you. you. Shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may cherish the commandments of Jehovah, your God, that I command you. Your eyes have seen what Jehovah did at Baal pure, for Jehovah, your God, destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of pure. But you who held fast to Jehovah your God are all alive today. So, who cleaved? What is it to cleave to Jehovah? Deuteronomy 13, 4. You shall walk after Jehovah your God, fear him, cherish his commandments, shema his voice, you shall serve him and cleave to him. So, to cleave to him, is to fear him, to cherish his commandments, and shema his voice. All those who feared Yehovah, who cherished his commandments, and shema his voice, survived. Proverbs 7, My son, keep my words, treasure up my commandments within you. Cherish my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye, something so precious to you. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Cherishing the commandments is life. If anyone comes away and tries to lead you away from that, with nothing to do with them. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, call understanding your intimate friend to keep you from the strange harlot, from the adulteress with their smooth words. As we said before, the harlot is smooth words to draw us into sin. And we need the corresponding and greater power of Jehovah's words to keep her from her clutches. Cherishing the commandment goes hand in hand with wisdom and understanding and it equals life. It keeps you from the harlot. The one who appeals to the desires of the flesh, the one comes with false doctrine. Back to Deuteronomy 4. But you who held fast, who cleave to Jehovah your God are all alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as Jehovah my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Compare that with the young man who walks along and lacks sense. Cherishing the commandment goes hand in hand then with wisdom and understanding. It is the wise who obey. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as Jehovah our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I've set before you today? We are very blessed. She was warning was, see that no one leads you astray. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Imagine being able to look over at the promised land thinking that you're going to be one of those that makes it. I'm sure that however real the promises of Jehovah are to us, that if we're not vigilant, then we're in danger of being led astray, just as some of those at Shittim were. We must cherish the commandments. We must have an appreciation of how blessed we are. And that will bring wisdom and guard us from the folly of wandering. Um, part two. So in part one, we looked at the need for vigilance, the need to watch and pray, to take heed. And we suggested that perhaps we're less inclined to be vigilant when we think we have it in the bag. We looked at the verse, lest anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And we'll start part two with a cautionary tale. We'll go to Judges 6. People of Israel did what was evil in the sight of Jehovah, and Jehovah gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. So trouble with Midian again. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to Jehovah. 
So the angel of Yehovah came and sat under the terebinth at Op Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abazarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of Yehovah appeared to him and said to him, Yehovah is with you, O mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Please, my lord, if Yehovah is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not Yehovah bring us up from Egypt? But now Yehovah has forsaken us, given us into the hand of Midian. And Yehovah turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Yehovah said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Of course, if Jehovah is with you, then all is well, no matter what the challenge. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you um, who I speak with. Uh, please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my presence and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So, it seems okay for Gideon to ask Yehovah for reassurance. Avram also asked for reassurance. He said to him, I am Yehovah who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? So it's worth noting that Avraham did not have the benefit of the word, he did not know Yehovah in the same way that we do. He was learning experientially about Yehovah as his life unfolded. Bear in mind also that Gideon didn't have a Bible on his coffee table. We are blessed to know Yehovah through his word. We have an understanding that helps us to trust him even in dire circumstances. Yehovah's word and our belief in it is his assurance to us. And there's nothing wrong, that's to say, with turning to him and obviously praying to him. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in the basket and the, the broth he put in the pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes, put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. And the angel of Jehovah reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock, consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes, and the angel of Jehovah vanished from his sight. Gideon perceived that he was the angel of Jehovah, and Gideon said, Alas, O oh Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of Jehovah face to face. Pretty incredible experience for this young man who's in one of the least of the tribes, and he's the least of the tribe of that. And even then, the tribes of, the tribes of Israel are there under the kosh of Midian. But Jehovah said to him, Peace be with you, do not fear, you shall not die. And Gideon built an altar there to Jehovah and called it, Jehovah is peace. To this day, it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abezerites. That night, Jehovah said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. Build an altar to Jehovah your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. And take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as Jehovah had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. So he's being tested here. This isn't an easy thing. He's actually scared. So it begins with him being tested and he is called to do what? To destroy the idols. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of all was broken down. The Asherah beside it was cut down and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. They said to one another, who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. And the men of the town said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of, uh, altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. Which gives us a pretty good idea as to how important these false gods were to those calling themselves Jehovah's people. Terrifying. But Joash said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. Isaiah 41, of those altars and things, you are nothing. Your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. It's exactly one of these people are at. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerobaal, that is to say, let Baal contend against him. 
because he broke down his altar. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. The spirit of Jehovah clothed Gideon and he sounded the trumpet and the uh, Abiziarites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messages to Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali and they went up to meet them. Gideon was tested. Now Jehovah is with him. Now he can succeed no matter what the circumstances or challenge. So then he asked for another sign, the sign of the fleece. This obviously needs more reassurance. Then we see that 300 men are selected from 32,000. Jehovah said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So the Lord's saying, if you take all these people, they're all going to think, look what we've achieved. And the Lord wants people to recognize he is the one who's given them the victory. Judges 7, then three companies blew the trumpets, broke the jars. They held in their left hands and torches, and in their right hands the trumpets to blow, and they cried out a sword for Jehovah and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried out and they fled. So here is Gideon, the one who declared, Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. But Jehovah is with him. And when they blew the 300 trumpets, Jehovah set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shita towards Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Meholah by Tabath. So Jehovah gave Israel this great victory. And it all begins with Gideon being tested. He was terrified, but he did what Jehovah asked of him and took these people. But he did it at night because he was too afraid. So <clears throat> he's tested in a big way. He seems to be this humble character. I'm nothing. I'm the least. I mean, you're even coming near me. Why do you ask me to do this? Yeah, he passes this test and leads um, the people to this great victory. He demonstrated his faith by his obedience, and Jehovah was with him. Now, as a result of the great victories that Jehovah brought about through Gideon, we read, Judges 8, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, you uh, and your son, and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. This isn't like a small thing. The people were completely oppressed. They were, their lives were completely miserable. And now, wow, we've been rescued. This is a big deal. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you. and My son will not rule over you. Jehovah will rule over you. Pretty cool. Rule over us, the desire for a human king over Israel started early in the nation's history. Of course, hundreds of years later in the days of Samuel the prophet and judge, God gave Israel the king they asked for. And here they are all the way back here. Will you rule over us. But this is a good response from Gideon. So he's ticking all the boxes, isn't he? He's, seems like a humble guy. He's, um, you know, he's tested and he's been seen to be faithful and he's, He's gone and brought this great victory as a result. And here he said, no, I'm not going to rule over you. That's um, Jehovah's position. He understood that it was not his place to take the throne over Israel and that the Lord God was king over Israel. Gideon then said to them, let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil, for they had gold earrings because uh, they were Ishmaelites. So he didn't pose it in a demand. He asked permission. Again, it seems like a, a reasonable character. They answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Beside the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian. And besides the collars that were around the necks of their camels. If a shekel weighs roughly 11 grams, we're looking at 18.7 kilograms or 41.4 pounds. Pretty substantial amount of gold. But then we read, Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city at Ophrah. And all Israel hoard after it there. And it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel and they raised their heads no more. The land had rest 40 years in the days of Gideon. So what is this became a snare? Um, <clears throat> we see 
a noose, um, by implication a hook, to be ensnared. And it's from this word here, to lure, entice, to lay a snare, lure, or a trap. So, <clears throat> this isn't good, is it? Gideon began by smashing an idol. He led the people to victory. He refused to become king over the people. Um, this is all great. But then he decided to make something from the spoils of the victory that Jehovah had given him and the people. And it was an ephod. And I don't know why it was an ephod that he was after, but we do know that it was a priestly garment, um, an ephod. Maybe he was thinking somehow that this was going to be some spiritual item or something. I do not. I don't know. But we do know the people hoard after it. It became something that led the people astray. It became a snare as well for Gideon, and it says, and for his family. So here's this guy. He's doing amazingly well, and everything's going great. You'd think he's completely set and he's rock solid. But somehow he decides to create this thing for whatever reason. That becomes a snare for him and his family, which is um, really pretty sad, isn't it? This is something the word suggests they were enticed by. I can't help but wonder what that is. Maybe it was a constant reminder of the day when maybe he felt important and he led the people to victory and stuff. And I don't know. <clears throat> it says that in Gideon's day there was peace. So at least he got to enjoy peace in his own day. But as we see, it was a snare for Gideon and it was a snare for his family. And after his death, we read that Jeroboam, the one who contends with Baal, Gideon, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. And Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son and called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age, and he was buried in the tomb of Joash's father, Ophrah, of the Abiezrites. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and hoard after the Baals and made Baal Barith their God. And the people of Israel did not remember Jehovah their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jeroboam, Gideon, in return for all the good that he'd done to Israel. Oh dear. The people of Israel turned again and hoard after the Baals. And I can't help but think that Gideon, the man who proved himself by smashing idols, by making the ephod for whatever reason, just fed the people's desire for idolatry. And as soon as he was gone, it's not surprising they fell straight back into worshipping the Baals. Next, we have the account of Abimelech, Gideon's son born to his concubine. And he plans to rule in place of Gideon's 70 sons that were born to his wives. In Judges 9, we read, Now Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives, said to them and to the whole clan of his mother's family, Say in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jeroboam rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh." And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, he is our brother. And he gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Barith, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. This is a man who wants to rule over the people. And of course, when Gideon was asked, he didn't even want to do that. And he's creating this situation here. And there he is getting the 70 pieces of silver from the house of a false god. And um, he hires worthless and reckless men. Well, reckless here is, see, something unimportant life to bubble up of frothing water. Worthless, empty, worthless, vain. So he took 70 pieces of silver from the house of a false god and used it to hire men who were empty, vain, worthless, wicked, light, unimportant and there's a connection made here between Israel's worship of false gods and the promotion of these character traits. Abimelech sets about establishing himself, and he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jeroboam, 70 men on one stone. 
But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. So it doesn't go well for Gideon and his family, does it, who were ensnared by this ephod. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years. Don't go well for this guy either. And God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem, and the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. That the violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might come and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother who killed him, and on the men of Shechem who strengthened his hands to kill his brothers, those worthless, reckless people. So Yehovah sent an evil spirit. If Yehovah is for you, then all is well. But if you go your own way, you abandon Yehovah, no matter how smart you may think you are, um, it is not going to end well. In everything you do, your main concern should be this. How does Yehovah feel about this? And Gideon should really have thought that before he decided to make this ephod that became a snare to him and to all his family. A certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. And then we read, And he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest they save me. A woman killed me. His young man thrust him through and he died. When the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everyone departed to his home. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads, and upon them came curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. Jehovah is sovereign over all things. And I just think this is an interesting tale of somebody who was riding so high and he was doing so well. And then just took this slight detour. And obviously, this is the, conse the consequences were pretty dire. So, lest anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. <clears throat> I finish part one by saying that we must be vigilant. That we must cherish the commandments. We must have an appreciation of how blessed we are. And that, that will bring wisdom and guard us from the folly of wandering. We must learn from the examples we've been given in Scripture that we might not desire evil as they did. That we would not be led astray. We read the verse, the highway of the upright is depart from evil. He who watches his way preserves his life. That's what we're to do. In the Septuagint it reads, the paths of life turn aside from evil. And the ways of righteousness are length of life. He that receives instruction shall be in prosperity. And he that regards reproofs shall be made wise. He that keeps his ways preserves his own soul. And he that loves his life will spare his mouth. The paths of life then turn aside from evil. Proverbs 1 Verse 10 says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths. Proverbs 4. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. We're called to be children of the light, children of the day. We're called to watch to be sober. <clears throat> so last week's portion ended with an example of what happens to those who do not turn away from evil and who are enticed by sinners. Number 25, the people commit whoredom at the daughters of Moab. They bow down to their gods, seduced into idolatry. Consequences. Yehovah said to Moshe, take all the heads of the people, hang them up before Yehovah against the sun, that the fierce anger of Yehovah may be turned away from Israel. Moshe said to the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one of his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought his brethren to his brethren, a Midianite woman, in the sight of Moshe and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Pinchas, the son of Eliat, the son of Achron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation, he took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent. He thrust both of them through, the man of Israel, the woman through her belly, so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Those who died in the plague were 24,000. Which brings us to this week's Parsha, which reads, Yehovah said to Moshe, Pinchas, the son of 
Phineas, the son of Eliatza, the son of Aharon, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. This word here is, you know, to, um, to be jealous, jealous or envious. And he says, therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. So this is Jehovah's response. He rewards him with his covenant of peace. And it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. Now, in the Hebrew text of the Torah, the first phrase used by Jehovah, we see Heshiv et Hamati, literally, Meaning he turned away the hot indignation or rage, displeasure or wrath that our Yehovah felt. Second phrase in the original Hebrew is lo chiliti vechini ati, literally meaning he carried forth to completion the zeal or passion which our Yehovah felt. So it would seem that Pinkas knew Yehovah. Of course, we get to know him through his word by cherishing his commandments and walking in his ways. By drawing near with the spiritual sacrifices. And if you don't know what that's all about, check out Parsha, Vayikra, and Zav. Thus says Jehovah, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am Jehovah who practices steadfast love and justice and righteousness in the earth. These things I delight in, declares Jehovah. So, Boast in the fact that you know me, that you know me character, you know me name. And as we'll see, what actually Pinkas is actually doing is he is acting in accordance with the word. In the story of Pinkas, we see an example of what happens when we do not cherish the commandments, when we do not watch and pray, when we do not keep ourselves set apart and holy, when we allow ourselves to be enticed going after the desires of the flesh. Ultimately, what happens is that the tabernacle or the, temporary, uh, the temple or the sanctuary is defiled. And um, we go back to Numbers 25. The name of the slain man of Israel who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, chief of a father's house belonging to the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the daughter of Zer, who was the tribal head of a father's house in Midian. As we read earlier, Jehovah spoke to Moshe saying, harass the Midianites, attack them. For they harassed you with their schemes by which they seduced you in the matter of Peor and the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a leader of Midian, their sister who was killed in the day of the plague because of Peor. In fact, the war against Midian was Moshe's last assignment. Numbers 31, we read, the Lord spoke to Moshe saying, avenge the people of, uh, avenge the people of Israel on the Midianites. Afterwards, you should be gathered to your people. So, <clears throat> zeal can be shown to be negative or positive depending on motive and loyalties. Zeal must be coupled with knowledge. Romans 10, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Of course, as I say, we see that Pingas asks, acts in accordance with the word. His zeal, um, therefore, is righteous. Positive zealousness brings about repentance too. We see in Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase and therefore be zealous and repent. Now, Pinchas is from the tribe of Levi. Zimri is from the tribe of um, Shimon. These two tribes were the ones who in Genesis 34.25 joined together in a conspiracy in order to, inverted commas, avenge the honor of their sister Dina by destroying the city of Shechem. Yaakov's blessings, spelt a bit strangely there. <laughs> we see Simeon and Levi are brothers, weapons of violence, cruelty, or their swords. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them, that's Simeon and Levi, in Yaakov and scatter them in Israel. So, what began as a partnership for evil between the tribes of Shimon and Levi, we can say pretty much effectively ended in last week's Parsha at the end when Pinchas representing Levi kills Zimri representing Shimon. In Genesis twenty nine thirty three, the name Shimon is directly linked to the verb Shema, meaning to hear. Um, the Simeonite 
Zimri, Zimri means my music, and the Midianite woman Cosby, which means liar or my lie. I think it's interesting. I don't often look in too much into the names of people, but this one interests me. It sounds like an apt description of many of those claiming to be God's children. Drawn away into spiritual fornication, dancing to their own tune, having given themselves over to a lie. I just think that's exactly what happens to so many people who really their only interest is to pander to their flesh. I mean, an act of zeal, Pincus kills the couple. You could ask, is Zimri the Simeonite any less of a zealot for his public display of sex in front of the tabernacle? It can be shown that the descendants of Simeon and Levi take different directions in how they handle their zeal. Numbers 26, what the census reveals. The result of the mixing of the Israelites with the daughters of Moab was the death of 24,000 Israelites by the plague. Numbers 26 gives us the current census number of Simeonites and Numbers 1 gives us the census number from the beginning of the Exodus. Numbers 26, 14, these are the families of the Simeonites, 22,200. Numbers 1, 23, those who were numbered of the tribe of Simeon were 59,300. So 59,300 at the beginning, 22,200 at the end. It's a 37,100 decrease in the number of Simeonites. And um, Rashi states, the tribe of Simeon has lost 37,100 people. It is easy to conclude that perhaps nearly all of the 24,000 who died from the plague were from the tribe of Simeon. Thus, we could also conclude that Zimri was a powerful leader of the Simeonites and personally responsible for their deaths as he led them in rebellion against Moshe and Yehovah. So therefore, we can make the conclusion that after the prophecy of Yaakov over his sons, the tribes of Levi and Simeon proceed in opposite directions with the choices on how to handle zeal. Zimri's zealous behavior had to be stopped. He was not dedicated to Yehovah. He had his own personal agenda. It seems that it was two tribes with two directions. One moved toward Yehovah, one moved toward self. One tribe's zeal merited blessing and honor. One tribe pretty much disappeared from the radar. In Deuteronomy, Moshe gives his final blessing to the tribes. Simeon receives no blessing whatsoever. And there's no mention of his name. So maybe you have been headed in the wrong direction. Maybe things are not going well. Of course, the Lord says, be zealous and repent. Simeon's inheritance was within the midst of Judah. And it seems that you find them under Judah's wings off and on throughout Scripture. You can see from the map here. But they're not off the radar here, though. We can see them mentioned in Revelation 7. It's not like they're completely forgotten. So why is this bad? Shechem and what Pinkas did. Righteous, the big clue. Shechem, Simeon and Levi acted of their own volition. Uh, but we see in contrast, after the plagues had issued from the sin of the spies and the rebellion of Korah, Jehovah had told Aharon and his sons and his father's family the Levites, that they were to bear the responsibility for offenses against the sanctuary. Zimri's offense was clearly an offense against the sanctuary. So while Moshe and the assembly of repentant Israelites were gathered at the tent of meeting, weeping before Yehovah over the sins of the people and the plague which had struck the camp as a result of that sin, Zimri came right up to the tent with the repentant, were weeping and mocked them and dishonored Yehovah, by bringing his sin right to the door of the tent of meeting. Pinchas was the son of Eliatzer, son of Aharon, and within the class of those who were to bear the responsibility for offenses against the sanctuary. And we see in um, Exodus 6.25, Eliatzer was Aharon's son. He took for himself one of the daughters of Putiel as wife, and she bore him Pinchas. So that's where he comes from. And Pinchas refused to let the tabernacle become defiled. He acted in accordance with Yehovah's word. He carried forth to completion the zeal or passion which Yehovah felt. Now, lest we think he was someone who was given to violence, in Joshua 22, we read of an incident involving the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, who had settled on the other side of the River Jordan. And they built a large altar by the river. And there's a misunderstanding that nearly leads to civil war. When the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. And the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, 
Phineas, the son of Eliat, said the priest. And with him, ten chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, every one of them ahead of the family among the clans of Israel. When they arrive, there's a confrontation. We say, thus says the whole congregation of Jehovah, what is this breach of faith that you've committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following Jehovah by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against Jehovah? Have we not had enough of the sin at Peor from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves and for which there came a plague upon the congregation of Jehovah? So the event has had this lasting impression on these people. The events that we've read about with regards to the idolatry <clears throat> Um, that took place at your team seem to have a profound effect on those who survived the judgment. And he says that you too must turn away this day from following Jehovah. And if you too rebel against Jehovah today and tomorrow, he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. But now if the land of your possession is unclean, pass over into Jehovah's land where Jehovah's tabernacle stands. Take for yourselves possession amongst us. Only do not rebel against Jehovah or make us as rebels by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of Jehovah, our God. That was the problem. They thought they were building an altar where they were going to make sacrifices. Well, as we see, Pinkas is, is involved in seeing that the tabernacle is regarded. And then he says, Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, break faith in the matter of the devoted things? And wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel. And he did not perish alone for his iniquity. Only do not rebel against Jehovah or make us as rebels. So they recognize that the nation as a whole is a corporate responsibility and they fear Jehovah. And they were vigilant just as we're called to be. In fact, we're told, exhort one another daily. And that's in Hebrews 3. <clears throat> so the people of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh explained that they did not build the altar for the purpose of making offerings and turning away from Jehovah and his commandments. Verse 24, we read, No, we did it from fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, What have you to do with Jehovah, the God of Israel? For Jehovah has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you. You, people of Reuben and people of Gad, you have no portion in Jehovah. So your children might make our children cease to worship Jehovah. Therefore, we said, Let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice but to be a witness between us and you and between our generations after us. Far be it from us that we should rebel against Jehovah and turn away this day from following Jehovah by building an altar for burnt offering, grain offering or sacrifice, other than the altar of Jehovah our God that stands before his tabernacle. When Pinchas the priest and the chiefs of the congregation, the heads of the families of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the people of Reuben and the people of Gad, the people of Manasseh spoke, it was good in their eyes. Pinchas, the son of Eliat, to the priest, said to the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of Manasseh, Today we know that Jehovah is in our midst because you have not committed this breach of faith against Jehovah. Now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of Jehovah. And Pinchas, the son of Eliat, and the priests and the chiefs returned from the people of Reuben and the people of Gad in the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan to the people of Israel and brought back word to them. The report was good in the eyes of the people of Israel and the people of Israel blessed God and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the people of Reuben and the people of Gad were settled. So here we have another incident where Pinchas shows that he is zealous for Jehovah. His zeal comes with understanding and yet again he acts righteously. And both times he brings about peace. But this, again, <laughs> this, is, um, this is something that we read about and probably... Don't have any idea as to how high the stakes were and how high the tensions were if there had been this war. So let's go back again to the end of last week's portion, the beginning of this week's. Behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought up his brethren, a Midianitish woman, in the sight of Moshe, in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now man, Pinchas, the son of Eliat, the son of Aharon, the priest, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand. He went after the man of Israel into the tent, thrust them both through. The man of Israel, the woman, threw her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. We see that 24,000 died, and then Jehovah said to Moshe, Pinchas, the son of Eliat, the son of Aharon, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel. He was zealous with my jealousy. Uh, among them so that I did not consume the people in my jealousy. 
Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. And it shall be to him his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. As we mentioned earlier in the story of Pinchas, we see an example of what happens when we don't cherish the commandments, we don't watch and pray, we do not keep ourselves set apart and holy, when we allow ourselves to be enticed, going after the desires of the flesh. As we said, ultimately what happens is that the tabernacle of this temple is defiled. Pinchas acted in accordance with the word, as we saw. He was concerned with protecting the sanctuary, the tabernacle, from being defiled. And he was rewarded with a covenant of peace. We see a covenant of peace mentioned elsewhere in scripture. And it has everything to do with the temple of Jehovah not being defiled. And it has everything to do with the Spirit of God. So the sanctuary is the place where Jehovah is to dwell. And remember, we are supposed to be the temple of Jehovah, the place where the Ruach HaKadosh dwells, 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If we defile that sanctuary, however, we will be cut off from among Jehovah's people. If any man defile the temple of God, as we see here in verse 17, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, you're not your own. You were bought with a price to glorify God in your body. How do we defile the temple? Ezekiel 14, everyone of the house of Israel or as a stranger that sojourns in Israel, which separates himself from me and set up idols in his heart, put the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, Yehovah, will answer him by myself. I will set my face against that man. I will make a sign and a proverb and cut him off from the midst of my people and you will know that I am Yehovah. So setting up idols in our heart causes the sanctuary, the dwelling place of the Spirit of God to be defiled and causes the person to be cut off from Jehovah's people. Setting up idols in your heart is the practice of those who don't cherish the commandments. The people who don't watch and pray, who don't keep themselves set apart and holy, the people who allow themselves to be enticed going after the desires of the flesh. Now from Parsha Hukat, we see the only way to cleanse the temple is with the waters of purification, which contain the ashes of the red heifer sacrifice. We read in Jeremiah that Jehovah had to force the house of Israel for a whoredom. Jeremiah 3. I saw um, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, again, going after all these idols, I had put it away and given her a bill of divorce, yet a treacherous sister feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So the house of Israel defile themselves by setting up idols in their hearts. And yet we read in Ezekiel, this is chapter 14, The house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but they may be my people and I may be their God, says the Lord. So Ezekiel writes that a time will come and the house of Israel will no longer be defiled and cut off from among Jehovah's people. So how will a time come when they will not be defiled? Ezekiel is prophesying that through Yeshua's death as the red heifer sacrifice, the house of Israel can be cleansed. Everything points to Yeshua. He was our red heifer sacrifice. And the ashes of the red heifer were mixed with living waters, which is the spirit of Jehovah for purification. And if you're confused about any of this, go and watch Parsha Chukat. Ezekiel prophesied that through Yeshua's death as the red heifer sacrifice, the house of Israel can be cleansed. Ezekiel 36. Jehovah speaks of the scattering of the house of Israel, how they've profaned his name. Then we read in verse 23. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. The heathen shall know that I am Yehovah, says the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. This is the waters of um, purification. From all your idols, I will cleanse you. This is speaking to us about us being cleansed um, from all the idols in our hearts which defiled us that we might be 
clean, that we might be a fit dwelling place for the Spirit of God. And your heart also will I give you, a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them. So, <clears throat> This is talking about the restoration of the kingdom. The two houses uniting is linked to the house of Israel being cleansed, sprinkled so that they can be filled with the spirit of God because they were cast out. Um, they defile themselves with um, setting up idols in their hearts and a way had to be made for them to be cleansed, sprinkled with the waters of purification. The only way to cleanse a temple that has been defiled is with the ashes of a red heifer mixed with living water to create these waters of separation. This is then sprinkled on that which needed to be cleansed. Regarding the waters of separation, the ashes of the red heifer mixed with living water. When one believes in Yeshua, the living water comes. And when mixed with the ashes of the red heifer, Yeshua's sacrifice, cleansing comes through what are known as the waters of separation. At the water libation ceremony during the last day of Sukkot, we read in John 7, the last day of the feast, the great day Yeshua stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Of this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given because Yeshua was not yet glorified. Holy Ghost was not yet given because Yeshua was not yet glorified. What's that about? John 16, nevertheless, I tell you the truth that it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. But we know that Yeshua was around at the same time as the Holy Spirit. But he says, if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Where did he mean he had to go? The answer, to go to the cross and be glorified, John 13. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, whither thou goest? She were answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Talking about the cross, of course. This is why Yeshua had to go away, to be offered up for the comforter, the Ruach, the Spirit to come. The house of Israel had defiled themselves with idols. They needed to be cleansed to become a sanctuary for the Spirit to dwell in order to be counted once more as the people of Jehovah. So the house of Israel were divorced. But Yehovah said they would once again be his people. We even see this in Hosea. That day declares Yehovah, you will call me my husband. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will have mercy on no mercy. I will say to you, not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Let's go back to Ezekiel. I will take you from among the heathen, gather you out of all countries, bring you to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. I will put my spirit within you. So those who would defile their temples, those who had been cast out, were to be clean once more. They were to be a fit place for the spirit of God to dwell. They were to be Yelva's people once more. Let's read on in the next chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37, what do we have? We have the dry, bro dry bones prophecy. The bones get flesh and sinew, but there was no breath in them. And then we read, in verse 14, I will put my spirit within you. You shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am Yehovah. I have spoken and I will do it, declares Yehovah. The word of Yehovah came to me. Son of man, take a stick, write on it for Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. I'm all the house of Israel associated with him. Then join them one to another into one stick that you may become one in your hand. This is obviously talking about the restoration of the kingdom. And when your people say to you, <clears throat> will you not tell us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm about to take the stick of Joseph that is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel associated with him and I will join with it the stick of Judah and make them one stick that they may be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write are in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations amongst which they have gone and will gather them from all around and bring them to their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one king shall be over them 
and they shall no longer be two nations and no longer divided into two kingdoms. This is talking about the restoration of the kingdom, which, as we see, involves the cleansing um, of those who would defile themselves, the house of Israel who defile themselves with their idols. And because of this cleansing, and they can become a place for the Spirit of God to dwell, then we have this no longer two nations, no longer divided into two kingdoms. Then what we see, they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols. I'm going to cleanse them and they're not going to go after idols anymore. Um, and I just can't help but think of uh, all that's been done for us, all that's um, been done that we can be the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. Um, and I think of I think of this story of the people in the second generation who are to enter into the promises and yet they end up missing the boat because they are led astray. We're not to be led astray. We're to be like um, Pinkas, who is concerned about the, um, the sanctuary that it won't be defiled. We're to have a zealousness that is based on Yehovah's word is based on his character. So he says, they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols and their detestable things or with any of their transgressions, but I will save them from all their backslidings which they've sinned and will cleanse them and they shall be my people, I'll be their God. My servant David shall be king over them, shall have one shepherd, they shall walk in my rules, be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Yaakov. Again, I think of all these people who thought they'd made it of the second generation, we're going into the promised land and they didn't go in. Where your fathers lived, they and their children, their children's children shall dwell there forever and David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. Then we see something interesting which ties us back to Pinkas. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. Interesting. My dwelling place shall be with them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am Jehovah who sanctifies them, who makes them holy, sets them apart from everywhere uh, around them. When my sanctuary is in their midst forever, my sanctuary which shall not be defiled. Pinkas was concerned with protecting the sanctuary from being defiled. He was rewarded with a covenant of peace. We see in Ezekiel 37 a covenant of peace mentioned, which has everything to do with the temple of Jehovah being clean, has everything to do with the Spirit of God. Consider what it cost for you to be cleansed. Everything points to Yeshua. He was our red effort sacrifice. We've had our temples cleansed. Let us not defile what Jehovah has made clean. We are the dwelling place of the spirit of holiness. But Jehovah will not dwell in the temple defiled by idols. He's made a way for us. Would we allow our temples to be defiled? Or would we be zealous like Pinkas and enjoy Jehovah's covenant of peace? The heart is where the spirit resides. We see this in 1 Corinthians 2.11. To be spiritually clean, we need to have a clean heart. And the question is, would you pick up a javelin? Are you concerned that the temple would not become defiled? The temple, which temple that you are? Create me a clean heart of God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. David knows that the Spirit of God, for it to dwell in him, he must have a clean heart, an undefiled temple. In Hebrew, having a clean heart means having a clean heart and a clean mind. Because in Scripture, it is the heart that has thoughts. We see that throughout Scripture. Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Jehovah, my rock and my redeemer. We're not passively to allow ourselves to entertain thoughts that defile us. We're to keep our thoughts in check. Casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, 
whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, there is any excellence, there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things, not the nonsense and the rubbish. Consider that you are the temple of Jehovah. Given the spirit acts upon the heart, that is to say that the spirit acts upon the heart and the mind, that which has thoughts. And we can see the doors to our tabernacle, to the temple of Jehovah, as being our eyes and our ears. Would you allow anything um, in that would defile the tabernacle, the temple of God, which temple that you are? David was a man after God's own heart, and he said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside, it shall not cleave to me. We are the dwelling place of the spirit of holiness. Would we allow our temples to be defiled? Or would we be zealous like Pinchas and then be able, like Pinchas, to enjoy Jehovah's covenant of peace? All right, part three. Excuse me. <coughs> there we go. So, in part two. We saw that the house of Israel had defiled themselves with idols. They needed to be cleansed to become a sanctuary for the Ruach to dwell in an order to be counted once more as Jehovah's people. The house of Israel were divorced. Jehovah said that they would once again be his people. Ezekiel 36. I'll take you from among the heathen, gather you out of all the countries, bring you into your own land. Sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness. From all your idols I will cleanse you and I will put my spirit within you. So those who defile themselves, defile their temples, those who had been cast out, were to be clean once more. They were to be a fit place for the Spirit of God to dwell. They were to be Jehovah's people once more. In Ezekiel 37, 14, I will put my Spirit within you. You shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am Jehovah. I have spoken. I will do it, declares Jehovah. The word of Jehovah came to me. Son of man, take a stick, write on it. Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Another stick, right on it, put Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel associated with him. Join them one to another into one stick, that they may become one in your hand, the restoration of the kingdom. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. One king shall be over them, and they shall be no longer two nations, no longer divided into two kingdoms. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols and with the detestable things, with any of their transgressions. I will be their God. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Yaakov, where your fathers lived. All this, of course, um, to do with them being cleansed <coughs> to be a fit place for Jehovah's spirit to dwell. And then we read, and I will make my covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will set them in the land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst forever. My dwelling place shall be with them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, <clears throat> we're going to have a look for a little bit more on the restoration of the kingdom and the giving of the Spirit. But please take on board everything um, that we've said and how it ties in with the story of um, Pinkas, who was involved with making sure that the the, um, the sanctuary was not defiled. And this idea of this covenant of peace for those people who have been cleansed, to those who no longer go after idols, who can become a part of Jehovah's people and part of his nation, the restoration of the kingdom. So <clears throat> let's go back in Israel's, uh, Israel's history to Zechariah, which name means Jehovah remembers. Zechariah was around at the same time as the prophet Haggai. Both Haggai and Zechariah motivated the people to rebuild the temple and to look for the fulfillment of Jehovah's promises. After the fall of Babylon to the Persian king Cyrus the Great, in 539 BC, exiled Judeans were permitted to return to Judah. Jeremiah 25:11 and 29:10 told that the exile of the people would be 70 years. The dates at the beginning of the book of Zechariah let us know that the 70 years is almost up from his first vision. We see, the angel of Jehovah said, O Jehovah Zevaiot, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years? 
Therefore, thus say, says Yehovah, I've returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares Yehovah Zavayot. The measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, says Yehovah Zavayot. My city shall again overflow with prosperity. Yehovah will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. So we have this time scale. We have a people in exile given great promises. Promises of return to the land. And yet we know that not all were keen to leave Babylon. This thing is in, <laughs> as a parallel to our story with the people who were you know, also given great promises and were going to go into the land <clears throat> and take all of the promises and they didn't want to leave behind things either. We see these people didn't want to leave Babylon. Perhaps they'd fallen into the lifestyle of the Babylonians and their idol worship and were going after the wrong things. A bit like those who didn't quite make it into the promised land of the second generation. Now, <clears throat> due to Cyrus's decree, initially only about 50,000 returned. Some returned later with Ezra. So we have a people who've been exiled, a people given great promises from Yehovah, a people called to return to the land and take hold of rich blessings, and yet we don't see a stampede. Even those who arrive first, uh, uh, let their enthusiasm dwindle when it comes to doing the work of Yehovah and building his house. And isn't it sad that so many chose to remain in Babylon? The fact that many stayed is even more bewildering when you consider that Yehovah had given warning. Jeremiah 51.6, flee from the midst of Babylon. Each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment, for this is Yehovah's time of vengeance. He's going to render recompense to her. Again, I think this is interesting. It kind of points us to something we see in Revelation. Flee from the midst of Babylon. He called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped up high as heaven, and God is remembering iniquities. Therefore, stand afar off in fear of her torment, and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon. In a single hour, your judgment has come. Again, this is a, a call to, to have wisdom and understanding that comes from cherishing the commandments and to flee from um, false doctrine, the whole, all that would lead you astray. Now, life in the land of Judah at this time was very tough. The temple was destroyed, as was the city of Jerusalem. Despite the promises of Jehovah, the people were not exactly enthused. So, like Haggai, Zechariah's message is one of encouragement. But he was aware that not all the returning, returning remnant were fully sincere in their desires to serve Jehovah, And he therefore counseled them to repent of sin and return to God with all their hearts and minds. And that's um, a summary from Boyce. In the book of Zechariah, we have a people who've been exiled, people given great promises from Yehovah. Only a remnant responded to the call to go and take hold of those promises. And so Zechariah begins by telling these people to repent, to acknowledge that in whatever has befallen them, Yehovah has been righteous. And for us as a people in exile, who've been given great promises from Yehovah, a people who should hope or hold hope of return to the land. And this message can be seen to be quite pertinent. Um, again, when we read scripture, it should um, instruct us and um, give us shed light on the situation that we might find ourselves in. The first six chapters of Zechariah contained eight visions. We see them outlined here. Let's just focus in on the fourth one. We have the iniquity of Joshua uh, being taken away, uh, filthy rags to pure, clean garments, the fifth vision. We have the menorah, the two olive trees, which represents the two houses of Israel. And these two olive trees provide golden oil for the lamp. And if you take these visions as a huge chiasm, then at the center we have Zechariah 3, I will bring my servant the branch. We no, from previous teachings, this is a reference to the Messiah to Yeshua. I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. And that day declares Yehovah Zavayot, 
Every one of you will invite his neighbour to come under his vine and under his fig tree. So this is um, pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> and I've, yeah, I've mentioned this before, the fig tree thing. But uh, we see something similar in uh, Micah. All pointing to the kingdom yet to come. The last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Yaakov. He will teach us of his ways and he will, we will walk in his paths for the Torah shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes, the strong nations far away, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. Now, throughout the book of Zechariah, written by a prophet sent to encourage the people to take hold of the promise of Yehovah, we see pictures of the kingdom to come. So it's a book that was written to those returning from the Babylonian exile, but it's certainly a book that's written to us as his people, um, scattered throughout the nations, as yet not gathered up, as we will be one day, as we read in Ezekiel. So, vision five here in this book, written to encourage those who were to return, we find the menorah. We also find the two olive trees, representing the two houses of Israel. Of course, Jehovah describes Israel as an olive tree in Jeremiah 11. Jehovah called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit, with the noise of a great tumult he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. So this one tree becomes two trees. Of course, we know of the northern kingdom that was sent off, um, captured by the Assyrians. In Scripture, we see them referred to as the wild olive tree. Of course, we've just mentioned Judah going into captivity in Babylon. They're known as the cultivated olive tree, but it was... One olive tree. I first see also Romans eleven seventeen to 24. We mentioned before the restoration of the kingdom. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, um, have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. The Messiah who did what? He made a way for us to be cleansed who made a way for us to be a part of Jehovah's kingdom who made a way for restoration to take place of course we read earlier I will bring my servant the branch which is a reference indeed to Yeshua five continues with regards to the menorah and the two olive trees representing the two houses I said to the angel who talked with me what are these my lord the angel who talked with me answered and said to me do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. And he said to me, this is the word of Yehovah to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yehovah Zavayot. So the call to Joshua and Zerubbabel is to return to the promised land and build the temple. And we get this, not by might nor by power, but my, my spirit, says Yehovah Zavayot. And there's such a lot just in that, isn't it? Um, this idea of building Yehovah's house, this place where he might dwell. And we know as his people, we are built together as living stones into the temple of Yehovah. But this is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. All this points us to is, um, strangely enough, is Shavuot. And we'll look at that later. The call to Joshua and Zerubbabel is to return to the promised land and build the temple. The temple of Jehovah is us. As I said before, we're built up as a spiritual house. And the Lord says, not by might, but by power, but by my spirit. The book is written to encourage those who were to return. And in this book, we find the two olive trees, the two houses of Israel. Now, the disciples wanted to see the kingdom restored. That is the wild olive tree and the cultivated olive tree coming together. And they seem to know that this was connected to the giving of the Spirit, which of course happened at Pentecost, Acts 1. And while staying with them, 
He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. The connection between the giving of the Spirit and the restoration of the kingdom. And then he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Samaria, of course, being the northern part of Israel. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So as we've seen, Ezekiel 14, the house of Israel had defiled themselves by setting idols in their hearts. The temples had been defiled and were no longer a fit place for the spirit of holiness to dwell. 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? It was Yeshua's death that provided a way for the house of Israel to come and to be cleansed. The only way to cleanse a temple that has been defiled is with the ashes of a red heifer being mixed with living water to create the waters of separation. This is then sprinkled on that which needs to be cleansed. Yeshua was the red heifer sacrifice that enabled the prophecy to be fulfilled. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You should be clean from all your filthiness, all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will put my spirit within you. And at the end of the eight visions found in the first six chapters of Zechariah, we read, Say to him, Thus says Jehovah Zavayot, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of Jehovah. Branch, as we mentioned many times, is a reference to Yeshua. So behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall build the temple of Jehovah. It's a reference to the people. Then we have a reference to those who are far off which is a reference uh, to the Gentiles that will become the house of Israel. Um, those who are the wild olive tree and those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of Jehovah. And you shall know that Jehovah Zavayot has sent me to you and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of Jehovah your God. So here in the book written to encourage those who are to return, we find the menorah, we find the two olive trees representing the two houses of Israel. We see that the branch, Yeshua, will build the temple of Yehovah, which is us as his people. To build this temple, he will use those who are far off, that is the Gentiles that will become the house of Israel, the wild olive tree. And in regards to building the temple, Yehovah declares, it's not by might nor by power, but my, my spirit, says Yehovah Zavayot. The restoration of the kingdom and given of the spirit of God and Shavuot. At Shavuot, two wave loaves were offered. Um, the two loaves represented the two houses. And in Leviticus 23, we read, You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto Jehovah. What happened in Acts 2, Shavuot, is all about the two houses. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these uh, who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Oh, Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were perplexed and amazed and said to one another, what does this mean? Others mocking said they are filled with new wine. And people missed the whole significance of what was going on here. The most incredible thing is not that Peter and his colleagues were filled with the Ruach HaKadosh and speaking as the Spirit gave them utterance. Those of the house of Judah already had the Spirit. Haggai the prophet to the house of Judah states that the house of Judah still had the Spirit. Haggai 2. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, says Jehovah, for I am with you, says Jehovah Zavayot, according to the word that I have covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my Spirit remains among you. Fear you not. The house of Israel, though, 
did not remember they had defiled themselves with their idols and had been cast off. They were no longer a fit dwelling place for the Spirit of God. The incredible thing going on here is what Shavuot was all about. The two houses represented by the loaves. It's all about the restoration of Israel, which as we've seen was connected to the giving of the Spirit. I will build my house up, not by might, not by power, but my Spirit. But it was the giving of the Spirit to those previously unclean and defiled, those cut off, those far away, the Gentiles, those of the nations, the house of Israel, that was the significant thing. In Acts 2, the Gentiles, those who had been out of covenant, were given the Ruach HaKadosh, as demonstrated by their having the gift of interpretation. Each one was hearing them speak in his own language. A way had been made for the Gentiles, those far off, the house of Israel. Those who thought the disciples were drunk did not have the interpretation. And what they heard was unintelligible babble. As we've seen, we find reference to the two houses of Israel in the book of Zechariah. A book written to encourage those who were to return. So much of this book points to the kingdom to come. The call is for the temple of Jehovah to be built. The call in the book is do the work of God. As we have just read, Haggai the prophet who, like Zechariah, also uh, brought words of encouragement. Haggai 2. Be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares Jehovah. Be strong, O Joshua, son of uh, Zehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares Jehovah. Work for him with you, declares Jehovah Zabaoth. So, just as they were called to work to build the temple of Jehovah, so we are called to work. And in John 6, we read, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Who is it you sent? The branch, our Messiah, Yeshua. Be strong, all you peoples of the land, declares Yehovah. Work, for I am with you, declares Yehovah. Zavayot. So the Feast of Shavuot then is an opportunity to celebrate the restoration of the kingdom. The fact that a way has been made for us. But thanks to Yeshua, we were described as once being far off and no longer alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. So, <clears throat> before we go on, um, I just think it's um, it's interesting that in so much of Scripture, um, we see in these accounts that from many years ago and stuff, we see things that are pertinent to us, I can think of, for example, um, when the people from Israel went over the Jordan to see those of Gad, um, Manasseh, and they were and Reuben, and they were concerned that they were, oh, they're doing something bad here. They're building this altar. They shouldn't be doing that. Um, and they went over there, and they they said they did. Re they remembered the whole thing with um, what happened to all pure. And they were like, don't you remember what happened? These incidents and events were pressed upon them and caused them to go because they were being vigilant. And we have all these things as well. We have that story just as much as they did. We know of it and it should enthuse us to be vigilant too, as should all these other things that we read in Scripture. And if you do read Zechariah, you will realize it isn't real. It, it really is about what Jehovah is going to do at the end of the age, um, just as much as it's a document of the history of what happened way back then. Anyway, what we've hopefully learned today is that we must be vigilant and that we must cherish the commandments. And if we don't, then we're in danger being led astray by flattering words and by false seducing doctrine. We must have an appreciation of how blessed we are. We have the word of the Lord, don't we? That will bring wisdom and it will guard us from the folly of wandering. We must learn from the examples that we've been given in Scripture. We must also see our part in it. Um, and see where we fit in and just try and grasp things like the fact that we are called the temple of the living God, that a way has been made for us. 
but also we should see the examples of the two peop two peoples. There was the, the you know Zimri, the Simeonite, who was just carried away with his own agenda and with the passions of his flesh. And compare that with Pinchas, who was actually concerned with the. He didn't want the sanctuary to be defiled, and we should be like him. Each one of us in our daily life should be just as zealous as Pinkas was, guarding the gates to our temple, our eyes and our ears. We learn from these people that we might not desire, desire evil as they did, that we would not be led astray. Consider what it cost for you to be cleansed. Remember that everything points to Yeshua, our red heifer sacrifice. Thanks to him, we have our temples cleansed. So let us not defile what he's made clean. As we've mentioned, the story of Pinchas, we see an example of what happens when we do not cherish the commandments and we don't watch and pray. And we don't make the effort to keep ourselves set apart and holy when we allow ourselves to be enticed going after the desires of the flesh. Ultimately, what happens is that the tabernacle, the temple is defiled. We are the dwelling place of the spirit of holiness. Yehovah will not dwell in a temple defiled by idols. It's made a way for us. Would we really allow ourselves to be defiled? Or would we be zealous like pink ass and enjoy Yehovah's covenant of peace? He was concerned with protecting the sanctuary from being defiled. He picked up his javelin. Question is, would you pick up your javelin? Or will you allow yourself to be defiled with the things that you allow yourself to think upon, the things that you allow to go in your ears and your eyes? We get a good example of how we should be um, in this man. He was offered Jehovah's covenant of peace, which as we've seen is also mentioned with regards to Jehovah's gathering of his people um, that we want obviously to be a part of. So let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. <clears throat> so watch and pray and take heed. Be sober, watch and pray. Talking of praying, should we pray now? Um, Lord, I pray that you'd help each of us to... Um, To learn from this that we have to be vigilant, that we have to watch in God um, the temple, which temple we are. Um, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to really understand what it is that you want us to learn from these things that you've put in Scripture. I pray, Lord, that people would take your warning seriously. Um, Pray, Lord, that you'd open people's eyes to, if they've been led astray, that they've listened to false doctrine and teaching. Not in your mercy, somehow, Lord, you'd make it. You'd make it. They'd be aware of what they've been doing and that they've just been pandering to their flesh. Thank you, Lord, um, for making a way for us to be your people. And to be a temple of your spirit. I just, Lord, for myself and for everyone who hears this, I just hope that it would never be lost on us. What that is, to be a temple for your spirit, what an incredible thing. And Lord, let us not be like those who just nearly got there and didn't, fell flat in the face. Just um, thank you for your warnings. And also, Lord, thank you for your encouragement, for your great kindness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord. Amen.